be not afraid of greatness. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and others have greatness thrust upon them. That is a statement out of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, and it has become a present-day challenge, inspiring people to live extraordinary lives. And while very few people would argue that there are not a lot of amazing people throughout Christianity and throughout the generations, a lot of times we struggle with what to do with the desire for greatness. Um, The actual idea of being great is not something that people necessarily have a problem with. It's the desire for greatness, the desire to be greatly used by God, the desire for God to do something big in and through your life. And sometimes it seems like that might be presumptuous or maybe it's prideful or maybe it's just plain wrong for a Christian to even think those thoughts. So in the Gospel of Mark, we find this interesting story that is connected with greatness. And in the story, Jesus not only models greatness, he actually gives instructions for those who want to become great. So just let that thought sink in for just a moment. He's basically saying, if you desire greatness, let me show you how. And this is a story that, at least on my side, is extremely encouraging because for me personally, as I've read through Scripture, I see so many of the warnings that come with pride and how it is that humility is exemplified as a godly characteristic. And I I don't want to side on the part of pride. And the other part of me, I go through and I read the stories of men and women that God has greatly used through Scripture, and I get inspired by that. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to just exist. I want to be greatly used by God. So I find myself praying prayers like, God, would you use me fully and use me completely? God, help me to be a part of something that makes a major difference. God, I want to be greatly used by you. And then it's right in the process of praying those prayers that these thoughts begin to sit in my mind like, is it okay for you to even pray that? Or should you be praying for more contentment? Or should you pray that maybe God does something great around you, but do you necessarily need to be a part of it? Is that selfish ambition? Or is maybe that a part of the prompting of God that he's made you for something more? So I just battle back and forth with these thoughts in my mind. So let me just kind of throw it out. If you might be in a place where there's a part of you that you want God to greatly use you, and then there's another part of you that you're concerned about overstepping some divine boundary by God, I think this passage has a lot to share with you. If you long for more than just routines and existing and survival, then I think this passage is incredibly encouraging. It is a story of instruction that also leads to a life of deeper fulfillment. So I invite you to go with me in your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter 10 will be in verses 32 through 45. It's a part of our Further Together series through the uh, year 2019. And as a part of that, I'm speaking this morning on the subject of further in greatness. Further in greatness. So we're going to read the text, pray, and jump into the truths from there. So look at verse number 32 of Mark 10 and following. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we may sit, one on your right and one on your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you shall drink, and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it has been prepared. 
Verse number 41. Hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John, calling them to himself. Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would guide us through this text, help us to be able to clearly see the truths that you are bringing out and what you want us to apply in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Life Magazine, a number of years ago, had an article comparing the lives of some great people like Winston Churchill, Pope John XXIII, and Albert Schweitzer, and a few others. And in the article, it said none of them aspired to greatness as the end goal. However, each of them sacrificed of himself or herself in order for the betterment of those around them. And the article concluded by saying this, they were considered great by others because they chose first to be good to others. That idea is echoed in the teachings of Jesus right here in John chapter 10. Greatness is not determined by how many people serve us. Greatness will be determined by how many people we serve. And Jesus actually goes beyond the desire for greatness all the way to the point of saying, if you want to be the greatest of all, if you want to be the top of the great list, here's how you do it. That is, you will be last of all, and you will be servant of all. It's a huge challenge, but I want us to kind of settle into what he's actually saying here. If you want to live an extraordinary life, if you want a life of greatness, if you want a life where God does amazing things in and through you, then this passage distinguishes between what is perceived greatness and what is actual greatness. And the appeal here is open to anyone. Jesus says in the text, if anyone wants to be first, or another translation says, whoever wishes to become great, you need to remember these truths. So what are the truths that we're supposed to remember? Here's truth number one. Greatness is connected to our purpose. Greatness is connected to our purpose. Now in Mark's gospel, there are three different texts in which Jesus describes his purpose, why it is that he came to earth from heaven. The first is found in chapter 1, verse 38. Jesus simply said, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. Okay, so first part of his purpose, he says, I came to preach. Then there's also another one in chapter 2, verse 17. It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. He came to call sinners. That's the second part of his purpose. And then the text that we're in right now, chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. So if you were to take those three texts and bring them together, you will find Jesus' purpose. That is why he came. Based on those texts, he came to preach, he came to call sinners, he came to serve others, and he came to give his life as a ransom for many. That was his purpose. Now, I know this next statement might sound too simplistic, but we don't have to complicate things. So here it is. Greatness is doing what God placed you on this earth to do. It's just that simple. Greatness is doing what God placed you on this earth to do. Greatness is connected to our purpose. It's been said before that people lose their way when they lose their why. Their why is connected to their purpose. Their why is connected to their reason for being. Why are they here? What is life supposed to be about? So this is a section in which greatness is connected back to our purpose. Look in verses 32 through 34, and you'll see that Jesus is moving towards his final purpose. I say that because this is the text where he's saying, I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. He's moving towards that. And this is now the third time that he has predicted the events that were awaiting him in Jerusalem. 
Every time he predicted these things, he gave a little bit more detail about what was going to happen. So now we get a much more full picture. That is, the events will occur in Jerusalem. Jesus will be betrayed. He will be condemned by the chief priests and the scribes. He'll be transferred to a Roman court. They will mock him. They will spit upon him. They will scourge him. They will crucify him. And three days later, he's going to rise again. Now, that is a lot of detail of what's waiting on the other end of this road. And in the text, we find it says in verse number 32, they were amazed and those who followed were fearful. Now, when I read the text, the first thought that came to my mind is, what are they amazed about? I mean, there doesn't seem like there's anything here that is amazement worthy to me. It wasn't like Jesus was performing a miracle. It wasn't like he was teaching some profound teaching. He was literally walking on the road, and it says, and they were amazed and they were fearful. And I was thinking, now, why were they amazed and fearful? Well, once again, this is where context is so crucial. Because in the context, they were amazed that he keeps walking towards exactly what was waiting for him on the other side. So here's what he just told them is waiting. That is, disgrace is just ahead, and he keeps walking. Trials are just ahead, and he keeps walking. Pain is over that last hill, and he keeps walking. Death and separation are over that last hill, and he keeps walking. But that is a peace that comes with greatness. When people are living out their purpose, God gives them the grace to keep on walking. I don't know if you all have ever watched the movie. If not, I want to encourage you to do so. If you need to, live stream it this afternoon. The movie is called Amazing Grace. And in the movie, it's the story of William Wilberforce with the help of John Newton as well as William Pitt as they endured two decades of ridicule, backroom politics, health issues, and overwhelming struggles in order to end the slave trade of the British Empire. And as I watched the movie, I was amazed that they kept going forward in spite of all the obstacles that kept coming at them from every single angle. In fact, when I watched the movie, here's what I can tell you. I walked away inspired. I walked away inspired not to back away from big problems. I walked away inspired to do the right thing even if nobody else wants to do the right thing. I I walked away inspired that you keep moving forward in spite of the fact that there's many problems that you're going to face along the way. But I also walked away amazed that they just kept on going. But in this text, I think there's a little bit more to that. Not only are they amazed and inspired that Jesus keeps walking towards what's waiting on the other end, it also says that they were fearful. Why were they fearful? Well, remember, they were the 12 with him. If death waits for them or him on the other side of the road, what's waiting for them on the other side of that road? Here's another reason why fear creeps in. Whenever greatness is connected to your purpose and purpose is connected to God's plan for your life, there's going to be some scary moments along the way. God doesn't tell us how everything is going to work out. God doesn't tell us where all the resources are going to come from. God doesn't tell us how everything is going to end. Instead, we are to walk forward in faith. The question becomes, will you keep walking? Greatness is connected to our purpose. So let me ask you this. What's your purpose? What is that godly agitation that sits deep in your spirit? What is that problem in the world that bothers you so much you cannot sit on the sidelines? What is that thing, whatever it might be, whether or not it is you came from a broken home and you said, I'm going to be the best parent I can be, or whether or not you came out of a difficult situation, you're saying, I want to help other people get out of this. Like, What is that thing that is in your spirit that just disturbs you, the thing that keeps you awake at night? Whatever that is, that's connected to your purpose. Now, somebody might say, I don't know what that is. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. Spend time with God and pray and say, God, help me to know my purpose. Did you know your purpose is often connected to your journey? As you look back over the course of your life, you will find God puts you in the exact right place at the right time to give you the education and the experience and the know-how that was necessary to fulfill the purpose that he has now called you to. Go back and say, God, 
I want to know what that is. And that's not just a one-time prayer. That could be a day after day after day. Keep coming to God until God clarifies what that purpose is. God is not hiding his plan and his purpose for your life because he wants to. Many times God keeps it concealed until you want it so bad you'll chase after him to get it. Chasing and say, God, why have you placed me here? What is my purpose? Here's another truth to remember for those wishing to become great. Greatness is not about the position we hold. Greatness is not about the position we hold. Now, after each of the three passion prophecies, and those passion prophecies would be those in which Jesus was sharing his death and his resurrection that was awaiting him there in Jerusalem. After each of those, there is an inappropriate comment that is made by his disciples. In fact, if it were not so consistent, it might be more funny if it were just one of them who said something. But it's every single time he talks about what's waiting for him, there is a very inappropriate comment. For example, after his first announcement is when Peter rebuked Jesus, chapter 8, verse 32. After his second announcement is when the disciples began to argue about which of them was the greatest of all, chapter 9, verse 34. And now, after his third announcement right here, James and John make one of the most selfish requests that you're going to find anywhere in Scripture, chapter 10, verses 35 through 37. So I want you to notice their request. Read it with me again in verse 35. Teacher, we want you to do for us Whatever we ask of you. What? Did they miss what Jesus just said in the two previous verses? Let's go back and reread those two verses and see if these boys had any home training. Look at what it says in verse 33. Jesus is saying, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. And will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. And look at what they say in verse 35. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Talk about bold. So what did they ask? It tells us in verse number 37. Grant that we may sit, one on your right, one on your left, in your glory. In other words, hey, Jesus, before you die, would you hook us up? Do you see how inappropriate this is? I mean, that could be some of the worst timing and the most selfish thing you're ever going to see in Scripture. And here's why I know I'm not God and Jesus is. Because he says in verse number 36, what do you want me to do for you? I'm thinking to myself, that's a lot more grace than I would be exercising at this moment. I would be like, you two, you're out. Like, I I don't care. You've been with me for three years, but you're not going to make it across the finish line. So anyway, their request is in verse number 37, grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. Now, here's what they wanted. They wanted the two most coveted positions in any kingdom. The position on the right was considered the most coveted. The position on the left was the second most coveted position. They wanted both of those between the siblings. Old Zebedee had to be proud of his boys at that moment. Just a thought. Okay, so here's the thing. They equated the positions with power and honor and fame and greatness. And notice his reply in verse 38. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized. Here's what he's saying. You want the position, but are you able to walk the path that will get you there? And notice how arrogant they are. They said, we're able. (laughs) To which that speaks a whole lot more in the text itself about their ignorance than what it does about their ability. You're going to find in a few moments that he's going to show them this is the path that you will be walking. But in this moment, they're thinking to themselves, yes, we can do exactly what it is that he's going to do. Greatness is not about the positions we hold. In fact, there are many great people who have never had a title, have never held a position, and have never had a gold nameplate on any door, and yet they are still considered great in the kingdom of God. Now, please hear me with this as well. There is nothing wrong with having a prominent and a powerful position. 
Nothing wrong with that at all. The Bible tells us whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. And when you're doing something with excellence and you're doing it with all of your might and you're doing it unto the Lord, oftentimes God chooses to promote that person to a higher position of authority. That's how God has often done things. The problem, though, is when we strive for the position to fill some internal need for greatness. Positions do not make us great. The moment we take our identity, our worth, or our value from the position we hold is the moment that we have bought into the world system of greatness and we've misunderstood what God's talking about completely. God does not measure greatness by our position. Here's the third truth. Greatness is discovered in the cup we drink. Greatness is discovered in the cup we drink. Now, it might sound like Jesus is speaking in some cryptic language when he has these two references here to a cup and to baptism, but the reality is he gave two analogies that they would have quickly been able to associate with. So here's the connection that he's making. It was the custom at a royal banquet for the king to hand a cup to each of his guests. And that cup was to represent the fullness of what the king had. And then listen to this. And it was an invitation to share in the full experience that the king had prepared for them. So over time, the cup became a metaphor of God's bounty and of God's experiences that he had set aside specifically for different individuals. So if you go back over into the 23rd Psalm, you'll find that David makes the statement. He says, my cup overflows. In other words, the experiences and the bounty and the blessings that God has prepared for me, it overflows. It's more than I can even get my mind around. But that same idea of a cup is also used on the difficult side or the correction side of what God has prepared for us. Isaiah the prophet in chapter 51 verse 17, he reflected upon the disasters and the problems that will come upon Israel for their sin and rebellion. And in that he said, they have drunk the cup of God's wrath. In other words, they are drinking the full experience that God has prepared for them based upon their rebellion and their sin towards God. So in this text, Jesus is talking about his cup, and he says, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? In other words, are you able to drink the full experience that the Father has prepared for me? Well, what was that experience? It was the cup of suffering that was coming. In fact, we find over in Mark 14 that while Jesus was praying in the garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus is telling us that there is a cup of suffering that is waiting for him. And he's telling his disciples, you want the positions of honor. You want me to give you whatever you ask of me. You think that if you have a position, that makes you great. But greatness is not found in the positions we have. Greatness will be discovered in the cup that you drink. It's God's plan for you. God has an experience specific for you. It's not that you need to find somebody else's experience and drink their cup. You need to drink what God has prepared for you. Now, there's going to be highs. There's going to be lows. There's going to be ups and downs. But both are necessary in order for God to prepare you for the experience and the life that he has prepared for you. The other phrase that Jesus uses here is the baptism with which I was baptized, or which, which he was baptized. Now, this Greek word, again, for baptize means to dip, to immerse, or to submerge under. It was used regularly to speak of anything that was immersed within an experience. So, for example, a drunk person would be said to be immersed in alcohol. A grief-stricken person was said to be immersed in sorrow. And Jesus is asking, can you be fully immersed? immersed in the experience that I have to go through. You want the crown, but can you bear the cross? You want all the benefits that come with greatness, but are you willing to follow that path? This is a trap that people fall into in their quest for greatness or their search for significance or success. That is, people want the prize without having to pay the price. 
they quickly respond in this section by saying, yes, Jesus, we can do that. But once again, that is a statement far more out of ignorance than it was out of their ability. They had no idea what Christ was talking about. And we know that because the same account is found in Luke chapter 18, verse 34. And it says, but the disciples understood none of these things. And the meaning of this statement was hidden from them, and they did not comprehend the things that were said. They had no idea what they were asking for. They had no idea of how to respond back to Jesus at this point. And Jesus goes on to tell them, you will experience a part of the cup, because suffering is waiting. You will be baptized with a baptism, because you're going to be fully immersed in this. But it's not going to be the same experience, and it's not going to be the same one that was prepared for him. In fact, we would find out later on that James will eventually be beheaded by King Agrippa in Acts chapter 12, verse 2, and John would be exiled to the island of Patmos and experience suffering and isolation there. Both had suffering in their future, but it was not on the same level as what Christ would experience. So here's the application for us. Greatness is discovered in the cup we drink. Now, you don't have to desire somebody else's cup. God's got one specifically for you. Your cup might not be to be the next Billy Graham. Your cup might not be to be the next Mother Teresa. Your cup might not be to be somebody else that you consider to be a great, wonderful person. Whatever that is, the issue is not how you drink someone else's cup. It's will you drink yours? Now, you might say, I got no idea what my cup is. How do I discover it? This is the easiest part. It will find you. And and here's what I mean by that. God will bring it into your life. He will stir your heart with it. He will give you the skills and the grace to go through it. And he will form you through the process. When you begin to look at what are the things that stir and bother you and how it is God's prepared you, you will begin to see how God has a cup specifically for you. So here's the truth. Very simple. Greatness is discovered in the cup we drink. Are you willing to drink the experiences that God has prepared for you? Here's the fourth one and we close. Greatness is measured by our service to others. Like many people today, the disciples were following the wrong example. Uh, They admired the glory and the authority that was given to Roman rulers. And while there was nothing wrong with aspiring to be great, we also have to be very careful about how we define greatness and, for that matter, why we want to achieve greatness at all. The pattern of Scripture is that being a servant precedes being a ruler. And that is true for Joseph, Moses, Joshua, David, Timothy, even Jesus himself. Unless we know how to obey, we don't have the right to give orders. Before a person exercises authority over others, he or she must learn how to live under the authority of others. Now, again, this is a trap that people fall into in their desire for greatness or their pathway to success, and that is they think that talent gives them the right to lead. They think that ability gives them the right to direct. They think that tenure should give them the right to speak. But listen, all of those things will help the leader, but they don't make the leader. Great leaders are first great followers. Now, this is going to be a little prickly, but I think we can all handle it here. We're grown-ups for the most part. So we're going to find out here. Okay. Here's why I say this is prickly. Sometimes we confuse rebellion with leadership. And here's what I mean. Somebody will say, I don't have to follow. I'm a born leader. I've been leading for a long time. Listen, you're asking me to do something. It's not in my nature to do. You, You know what that is? That is pride and that is rebellion and both lead to destruction. Great leaders are first great followers. And here's another reason this can be prickly. Sometimes parents say the same thing in reference to their kids. If they got a strong-willed child, a child that's rebellious, a child that doesn't listen, they'll often say, it's hard now, but that's great leadership down the road. Please be careful on this. Please be careful. Here's what I want to try to say. 
I am not saying that your child may not be a great leader down the road, but the reason they will become a great leader is not because of unyielding rebellion. God equates unyielding rebellion with foolishness and tells the parents it's your job to drive that out of your kids, otherwise you will ruin their life. Now, let me pause there because I know I'm going to stir some stuff up and I'll get an email or two. So I, I want to make sure I'm as clear as I can be. Okay. Leadership is not built on great rebellion. It is learned in great submission. It is in submission, remember, that a person learns discipline. It's in submission that they learn wisdom. It's in submission that they learn truth. It's in submission that they learn discernment so that they can lead their own life well. And hopefully down the road, they get a chance to lead others well. Great leaders are first great followers. In this, Jesus used himself as the final illustration. He says in verse 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. The word ransom is a metaphorical word here drawn from an ancient economic transaction. That is, in the transaction, there would be either a slave, a prisoner, or a forfeited piece of property that might be freed for a price. And what Jesus is saying is, I'll give my life because that's the price that is necessary to free the world. It, he's saying that I'm going to give this as a ransom. This is what is necessary. If what is called for is my complete life, I'm willing to serve at that level. He says, I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Greatness is measured by our service to others. As you think through great people that you consider to be wonderful, those you consider to be role models, you'll find this common denominator. They gave themselves to reduce the sorrow or increase the joy of those that were around them. That's the same path that's open to every single one of us. So what could you look for in your life for this path of greatness? I, I want to encourage you, pray and say, God, what is my purpose? Why am I here? What have you called me to? What is that godly irritation that he's placed in you? What does your path of greatness look like? Once you find what that path is, you keep walking. When things get difficult, you keep walking. When others are against it, you keep walking. And it's through the process that he molds you into the person he's called you to be. God's given us a promise. When we serve as he's outlined, our lives are considered great in the eyes of God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we close out this text, Lord, we ask that you would give us the encouragement that is necessary in order to, to spend the time with you that we need to spend to hear the truths from new you that we need to hear. God, for those who do desire that their life make a difference, they, they want to be greatly used. God, I pray that you would meet them in sweetness in that time alone with you. Give them the direction that you've called them to. And God, I pray that you would give them incredible tenacity and strength and grace to keep walking forward, doing what it is that you've placed them on this earth to do. God, we thank you for texts like this that help us to understand a biblical view of greatness. In Jesus' name, amen.